you can see, is neither spellable nor pronounceable, Alexander von Sitzewitz, originally <laughs> from Germany, but now living in the United States since eight years, enjoying her life in Massachusetts as of now, and enjoying the beautiful summers, not so much the winters, but they're also an experience, definitely. And I'm talking about software architecture today, and how you have to become really passionate about architecture if you want your project to survive long term. But why am I talking about this? What entitles me to teach you something about architecture? Because you guys are working on software all the time. What do I know that you don't know? Yeah, let's say I made some interesting experiences over the course of my career, uh, which started back in the 90s in Germany. And in shortly after university, I, I started my own business. It was a consulting company, so we did projects for other companies. And of course, when you come from university, you have that paper that tells you, hey, you're really smart. You got a diploma, so you basically can prove that you're outstandingly smart because you have that piece of paper. That means complexity is something that really can't harm you because you're smart. You're a rocket scientist, more or less, so complexity, no problem, no issue. <laughs> Of course, when you're young and, and, and you can prove that you're smart, you also want to get rich quickly. Yeah? So that's, that's the next goal. After you have that paper in your hand, you want to convert it into lots of money, euros, dollars, Deutschmarks, whatsoever. Yeah? So I tried to do that. So I created that business, consulting business, and we started, um, and I had my first employees pretty quickly, and they were helping me doing projects for other companies like Siemens or BMW or whatsoever. We were coding for them. And that was cool, and it was risk-free because it was basically time and material based, so we were paid for every hour. Which is pretty nice, but not nice if you want to get rich quickly because the profit margin wasn't so outstanding. So you still had the risk that sometimes people didn't have a job, so you still had to pay them, so it was a hassle. Yeah, it was not running fast enough for me. So how, how, how to change that? So I thought since I'm a rocket scientist, I should come up with something. And I came up with a brilliant idea to sell fixed price projects. Yeah, because if I do that, of course, I'm going to make a lot of money. Because since we're so smart, we're going to just need a quarter of the time that we sell the customers, and then everything is going to be fine. So that was a great idea, as you can think. Yeah, so it worked pretty. In, in the beginning, it was really a smart idea because the first few we got this nice first fixed price project. It was a complex C++ project just right down our alley. And we thought, oh, we can handle that. So we started coding on day number one. Of course, we had no time to think about trivial things like architecture. Come on. So <laughs> what kind of grim things about architecture? It's just like the architecture is a side effect of the user stories. That's what the Android <laughs> people say, right? It happens automatically. Yeah? So we had that mindset, so we were, at the beginning, we had features by the hour, it was great, really, we were incredibly fast. Unfortunately, after a couple of weeks, it started to slow down considerably, so we only had features by the day, and then suddenly features by the week, and then suddenly we had no features at all in another week, and we broke a couple of features that we already thought we had. Then we fixed those features that we uh, just broke, and then some other features weren't working tried to fix those, and some other features were there. we tried to fix those, and then something else wasn't working. So we basically got stuck in our own piece of garbage that we coded there. I have to say it very brutally, because at the end it wasn't beautiful. It was very efficient, fast at the beginning, but, but at the end it was just a big ball of mud. Everything was connected to everything. And instead of getting rich quickly, I was getting bankrupt very quickly, because time was running. No new money coming from the customer, and, and I was too proud and also too realistic to go to my customer and say, "Hey, by the way, can you try? To, can, can you double the price for the project somehow?" Yeah, so that, that didn't really work. So that was not that was not an option. So okay. So but sometimes if you're really desperate, heaven helps, and heaven helped me by recommending a book to me from a guy called John Larkos, and he wrote a great book about large-scale C++ design. I can still recommend this book to this day because it talks about some things I didn't know about at that time because I was so smart, I thought I would never need it. He talked about architecture and organizing code and managing dependencies and all these kind of things, and especially how you do this and how to do that. In I actually know John Larkos personally. I've worked with him. Oh! In fact, I reviewed this book with him. Oh! And 
and uh, he was my mentor. And uh, the company I worked before we joined was JP Morgan. So I do um, second all your thinking and fully agree. Very cool. So you have to give me his contact later. I have to talk to this guy. I'm a big fan of him. He's what? I think he's at Boomba. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of this guy and he, he saved my company at that time with his book, yeah, so definitely. So it was actually, it, it, it was at the end, I read the book over the weekend, it was very depressing because it was basically seven, hundred, seven eight hundred pages of everything we did wrong, so we, <laughs> we did nothing right basically, yeah, so. So and that means we had to throw all the code away and start from scratch with the ideas of John Marcos. But the miracle that happened at the end is we were able to finish our project. Of course, we went basically almost bankrupt. It cost us way more than we made money with, so all the little profits we made before with the time and material project was completely gone and then some. And we were very late because we wasted so much time by having no time for architecture. So it was a tough lesson, but I think at least I tried to not to make the same mistake twice. And since that point in time, I'm very, very critical about architecture. I think that's very important to think about how do you structure your code? What are the major obstructions in your code base? It doesn't mean that you have to make the complete building plan or cathedral plan when before you start your first line of coding, but you always, while you're coding, you should also have an idea about the structure of what you're coding and should have a possibility to enforce that structure somehow. So now I can actually start with my talk that you know why I'm passionate about it. So <clears throat> love your architecture. So I, I'm, I'm a big architecture lover by now. I think it's a very powerful thing to have a good architecture in a software system. And what does it mean? It basically doesn't mean that you write many nice PowerPoint slides. It actually means that you go down to the code base and check dependencies and manage dependencies. Because architecture is derived from dependency management. If you don't manage your dependencies, you have no architecture in your, in your system. So that's the key work. So who of you guys is a software architect? Or none, a few, very few actually, yeah. So, and, and of the people who said they are software architects, who's actually managing dependencies? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so you're doing your job, now, because I know many software architects who are getting more and more remote from the code base and don't do things like that anymore. But it's not their fault in many cases, many, in many cases it's just like their boss tells them, you're an architect, John, you're not supposed to cut, touch the code anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a grave mistake. There are other big mistakes because then the other sad story in many big organizations is if you have your most talented programmers get promoted away from programming. So so that's not very smart because it, it brings many of your systems into jeopardy sooner or later. You gotta keep these people coding and give them tons of money of course. So <laughs> give them another way to get rich. Yeah. No, I just I heard you say tons of money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Pay them well, make them happy and they will code very nice systems for you. Because if you don't manage your dependencies your code will look like this. That's not, I'm not sure if this is clearly visible or over the distance. Uh, it's, the resolution is not good enough, but what this is, it's basically a big image of a package dependency graph from a famous open source project. That open source project is called Apache Cassandra. And those packages are basically, 98% of all packages of Apache Cassandra, they're in one big blob. So there, there are no packages anymore, because if you, if you take this literally, Apache Cassandra has five packages. This one, and four smaller other ones that are not cyclic. Yeah. <laughs> so now look at this code base. Have you seen something like this in your career? <laughs> Come on, admit it, you can do it. A lot of people have, have gone through it too. Yes. Anybody seen a messy code base? <laughs> Hands up, please. <laughs> Do you work on a messy code base right now? No. <laughs> oh, so so one, one honest guy here in the room too. <laughs> Come on. Okay, a minute. Most of the times code gets messy over time. That's, that's basically an automatic. Because if you don't control dependencies, it's just what happens. That's the law of entropy of the universe. There's nothing you can do about it except being 
managing dependencies and enforcing them somehow. <coughs> so, since we already established that it's very probable that your code base is going to go down the road of a big ball of mud if you don't do anything, and people should be aware of it, so why, why do people not manage dependencies in every project and try to avoid that somehow? Yeah? Because that would be a good investment into the future health of a software system. But there are many, many reasons. It's ma ma many times it's organizational that people just don't have the flexibility, organizational flexibility, to change the rules and somehow to enforce certain rules. Then we have often a lack of technical leadership in that case. Because if you have agile teams, many times you make the mistake that every people have the same kind of responsibility. There's no team leader in that, that, that way, shape, or form that can define some rules, define an architecture. And if you have this distributed responsibility, it basically means nobody's really responsible at the end when it comes to, to looking at it. Because how do you, how do you decide who, who calls the shots? Yeah? Because I know it from, I, I have a small team. We are seven developers at, at Halo Tomorrow. We've been working on Sonograph since more than 10 years now. And we have lots of discussions about how to do stuff. Yeah? And sometimes we simply don't agree, so we have different opinions about how, how certain stuff should be done. Then somebody needs to call the last shot and say, we're going to do it this way, even if you don't like it this way, because we have to make a decision. We can't have both ways in the same code base. That's not a good thing. But because many organizations try to avoid these kind of conflicts, then everybody does what he wants to do, and that contributes to the big ball of mud of course even faster. Then, of course, you need to have some tool that allows you to check the conformity of, of your dependency system, your, your, your architectural definition, your architectural blueprint to the actual code. That is still a topic where people hardly like to invest into tools in this area, although they're available since quite some time now in the meantime. And uh, who has time for that? Yeah? We're always under time pressure. Deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. So, so like we, when we started our C++, we have no time for architecture because we were going to want to get rich quickly. In a transcendent way, this is true for many projects. Many projects think they don't have time to do the right thing, so they, 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 they avoid to put in the extra initial effort that is necessary to keep stuff organized, and they're going to pay for it over the lifetime of the project, and it's going to be very, very expensive. I can tell you now from customer stories that if you, assuming you would start a project from scratch and invest the initial time to, to, to get some technical quality rules enforced and some architectural rules enforced from the very beginning of the project and through its lifetime, you can easily halve the lifetime cost of this project. You can easily reduce it by 50%. And it's still kind of a secret for me why not everybody is doing that and trying that from the beginning. But it, it requires discipline, it requires some upfront thinking about it, some strategic thinking about how you're going to manage your code base. So one side effect of not doing this is, um, or not doing it efficiently enough, is that we get more and more technical debt in our code base. So that's a, that's a hipster word right now, technical debt, of course, you hear about it on many conferences. And it was invented originally by this guy, Ward Cunningham, in, in 1992. And he talks about code that is not quite right. I think that sums it up in, in plain English pretty nicely. You know? So you, you add up more and more and more code that is not quite right. And that code is going to cost you because people have to work around the code that is not quite right. And uh, by doing that, they will add more code that is not quite right. So it kind of grows exponentially in your code base. And what you get is a growing, exp uh, growing curve for the cost of change. The longer your project lives and the more code you add, the more expensive it becomes to do changes. And usually in many projects, this, this, this curve is growing close to exponentially after some time. That's why it's really important to fight that devil early enough, because if you, if you go down to a point, like Apache Cassandra, for example, if you saw that example, if you saw that graph, it's basically not possible anymore to disentangle that mess. It would cost too much. It would take too much time. Nobody's going to do that anymore, so you have to live with it. And that's going to make every single change you do in your software system more expensive. 
So how do we track technical debt? So how do we define it in the first place? So code that is not quite right, and basically you have, we have to be a little bit more specific about it when we want to measure it. And so there are different categories of te technical debt. So we can talk about architectural rules and count violations of those architectural rules. That would be one metric for technical debt. Another one would be metric-based rules, where you define certain metric thresholds for your code base and say if metrics are being worse than that, then this is counted as a violation. So you can count this, you can count programming rule violations, PMD rules and stuff like this, so now cube rules as technical debt, and then you can have testing rules about minimum test coverage and number of test cases you want to have for stuff, and uh, make sure that complex code is actually covered by test cases. Also you can count the violations of those rules, and then you come up with a number of rule violations, and that would be an estimation for your technical debt. But that's not the whole story, because different violations have different effects. So you actually have to think about how to weigh in those different kinds of technical debt. That's why I'm talking about categories of technical debt. And I'm looking at those categories by looking at repair costs. So how difficult or how expensive would it be to, to repair a single fault in that category? Then about the visible impact, is it visible for the end user if something is broken in that category? And then the maintainability impact, how, mu how much does a, does a violation of that will impact the maintainability of my code base? So, um, for example, programming rules, repair costs usually very low because it's a local fix. So if you have an empty cache block or you forgot to, to lock your, your exception, you know, that's, a, that's a simple fix. You can just change one line of code and it's done. The visible impact, is usually it's not visible. Sometimes if you get very unlucky, a programming rule violation might actually cause a visible bug, so the end user might see it. That's why conservatively for medium year, actually, I would tend to put low in here. That there's no real visible impact of programming rule violations most of the times. And the maintainability impact is also mostly low because we're only having a local change. So a missing lock statement in a catch block is not going to ruin the viability of the extensibility of your application. Testing is a little different story. If you, if you don't write unit tests with the code while you're developing, it's going to get a lot harder to do it later. I don't know who had the ever had the task to, te to write test cases for code after the fact. Especially maybe code that he personally hasn't even written. That gets a lot harder, so most people don't do it anymore. And it's, so you, you've got to do it from the beginning. And the repair cost, if you don't do it right, this will be expensive. Yeah. You've got to code and write test code and code together. The visible impact is high. If you don't test your code properly, your users will find a lot of problems automatically. Yeah. So, and that's not good. So you'll be in trouble. And the maintainability impact is medium to high also because you know, if, you, if you don't have test code, don't have good test coverage, you can't change your code so easily because you never know if you break something. The good thing about a good test coverage, if you do a refactoring, you can run your test cases after the refactoring and still see if the code is working or not. And without this luxury, you, you won't know. You can be bold and say we're going to release anyway, but it's much more risky. So you don't want to skimp on testing, that's for sure. <coughs> when we look at software metrics, we have two stories here. We have um, local metrics and global metrics. Local metrics are, for example, the cyclomatic complexity, the McCabe number for a method who tells how many decision points do I have in a method, and how, means basically how many test cases do I need at a minimum to get this fully tested. That's a local metric, and if this local metric is off, it's very simple fix. Just split up the metric, uh, the, the method, make it less complex, and, and done. Usually very low visible impact. The end users can't see the mess of code behind the beautiful user interface. And the maintainability impact for local metrics is also low, because it's a local change. If you look at global metrics, like number of cyclic dependencies, or average component dependency, or stuff like this, it's a different story. If you have a high average component dependency number, which basically the, the Apache Cassandra project has a very high com average component dependency, something like 500, it means every Java file in Apache Cassandra directly or indirectly depends on 500 other ones. That's, if I do software assessments, that's one of the first numbers I'm looking at because I know if they're in trouble or not. If this number is 500, I know the team is in trouble because 
it's very hard to see if you make a change, it might affect 500 other Java files in your code base. So it gets kind of complica complicated to estimate the consequences of that change. So it's it's and, and the sad thing, if your coupling is high once, that's why this architecture thing is so important. If your coupling gets over this point, if you get to the stage of the big ball of mud, it's so hard to repair it after the fact. It's close to impossible. You can't do it anymore. That's why the best medicine here in that case is just try to avoid to make it happen in the first place, instead of dealing with the consequences for years after. And the maintainability impact is also high, because if you have a highly coupled code base, that will affect your maintainability. It's much harder to maintain a code base where everything is connected to everything. Also, you're not flexible with technology changes anymore, because everything is baking, hard-coded into the base. Yeah? If you want to just replace a certain aspect of your code base, you can't do it anymore. You're basically glued to, to your initial decisions. And architecture, that's an interesting point, is if, if you don't get that right, the repair cost is very high. If your architecture is messed up, after fixing it after the fact is very, very expensive and takes a lot of effort. The visible impact is very low. The end user can't see the crappy architecture directly. You might see it indirectly by long change durations, long lifetime of defects and stuff like this, and every change is very expensive and takes a lot of time, that those are indirect indicators that something is wrong, but you can't see the messy architecture just from looking at the software from the outside. And maintainability impact is also high because everything gets a lot harder if the architecture is not right. And now look at this the medium column is an interesting one because I think that's the reason why most teams spend most of the effort on the two f first two lines. So many people now use something like SonarCube, yeah, a very nice tool. Who's using SonarCube anywhere? Hmm? About 40% about maybe. And yeah, SonarCube is cool because it allows you to start measuring your technical depth. But the downside of it is that it doesn't tell you the whole story. So if you think your sonar cube screen is green and everything is beautiful and your number of violations are very low, you can still have a crappy piece of code under there because it doesn't look at the architectural things most of the time. Yeah. You can get some indications for bad architecture because sonar cube also looks actually at psychic dependencies, which is a good thing. So it is an indicator that you find there. And if this indicator is very high, you're in trouble yeah. automatically. So SonarCube is good, but know what you measure. And don't, don't think just because SonarCube is green, everything is perfect. Because look at all the dimensions. And the architectural one is a very important one that is very often overlooked in this process. Especially after people have SonarCube, they say, oh, you don't need to check anything else now because we have SonarCube and now we know what we're doing. It's only part of the truth. Yeah, Agile teams. Who's working in an Agile team here? <laughs> yeah, well, the majority I would say. Yeah, and yeah, agile can be cool, and but it's often very, very misunderstood. Yeah, so so many people think now we're doing agile means everybody can do what he finally wants. Yeah, so <laughs> no more control, no more rules, no nothing. Yeah, of course, that's a very extreme interpretation of the agile manifesto, and usually that doesn't work very well. Yeah. If you, if you get to this point. Actually, if you do agile right, it's a very disciplined process. It requires a lot of discipline to do it right. And you need to manage your technical debt. If you, if you do agile without measuring your technical debt, you're flying blind. You don't know what you're doing, literally. And of course, the consequences will be that you have a lot of technical debt at the end, and that will screw up your project, medium or long term, anyway. So you have to manage your technical debt means you have to measure it first and you have to do something about when you have technical debt. You can't just accumulate it all the time and see it growing and growing and sometimes you need to add some tasks to a sprint where you said this sprint we're going to reduce our technical debt at least 50% of the time for the sprint. And that already gives us an indication that the original idea of the Agile Manifesto that everything is only driven by user stories and business value is crooked. Yeah. That doesn't really work for large projects. It works for small projects, yeah. If you have 20,000, 30,000 lines of code projects, it might work this way. But it doesn't work if you have 100,000 of code lines. 
Uh, if you have big projects with 100,000 of lines of code, I would say everything over 50,000, you have to start thinking about what you're doing. Then, then you need to be more serious about it. You need to invest some of your time into what I call code hygiene. Yeah? And uh, my, my rule of thumb number is about 20% of the time, one day per week, should be dedicated to code hygiene purposes. Cleaning up stuff, reducing technical debt, making things better where you had a hack where so many times you have a deadline, you make some shortcuts to make it happen, then the next sprint take that time to clean up the mess that you created for whatsoever. Yeah. If you use this 20%, you'll be in good shape because it's well invested money. So if you have the architectural rules and the 20% together, the total lifetime cost of the project will be significantly lower than if you don't. But of course, in the short term, it will always cost you. And that's why it's so difficult, because on this, we, we only thinking short term nowadays. Oh, we just need to meet the next deadline, the next sprint. That's all that counts. And we don't look two, three, four sprints ahead, because we have no time for that. And that's causing a lot of problems down the road. So Robert Martin expressed that very nicely. Um, he said, overall, the software starts to rot like a bad piece of meat. And I think that's a, that's a nice metaphor, because I've seen that in so many software systems. I've really literally done dozens of assessments of large software systems all over the world. And I can tell you, in 90% of the assessments, we get very bad results about the metrics, the couplings, and the state of the software system. So I know what developers have to deal with every day normally. And it's not so much fun. Uh, it's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. And the symptoms, you've seen them all. Uh, just rigidity was the one thing in our C++ project. We change something in one place, it breaks in another place. That's, that's a very typical symptom. So now, let's, let's ask you guys, who's, who's um, managing technical debt? Of measuring technical debt somehow. At least all the SOMA Q people at least should, should lift their arm because at least they, they measure part of their technical debt, which is at the beginning. It's better than nothing. So, um, but actually, for, of those SOMA Cube users, who's actually looking at the results and doing something with them? Good. Because that's something I see many times. We have that SOMA Cube server running. Wonderfully, but he runs on its own, so nobody ever looks at the screens that are coming from the beautiful tool. So it's maybe good for the consciousness, but I, I, I don't know. So it's not very effective, of course, if you don't do anything about all the nice reports you're getting from this tool. So you have to actually do some action. So that's something I find many times you start doing the right thing, but then you're not consequent. You're not implementing it to the end. You're not defining rules and, and follow through on it. But then the next thing is, who has something like a formal architectural model that can be verified? Anybody? So that's that's what always that's a puzzling point where I'm always just saying, can that be true? Because most of the times maybe one or two guys lift their hands and they're using then maybe one of our competitors' products, or even if I'm very lucky, our own product. But usually that rarely ever happens. So. And, and it, it's strange because now we just established that architectural debt is very toxic, very bad for your project, but nobody's doing anything about it. And I can tell you one more reason why this is the case, because many times the architectural debt, of course, is the elephant in the room. That's a big root cause, but it has so many symptoms up top, and all those symptoms that shows up, like high defect rates and complicated changes, they're, they're causing other problems, and those problems are always a high priority. Yeah? So you look at the high priority problems, the crashes, the defects, and nobody's really looking at the root cause of that thing, which is basically the large amount of structural erosion you have in your code base. So then let's get, how, how can we get passionate about our architecture? So, how, so first of all, we need to define a formal architectural model. And PowerPoint is not enough, because PowerPoint can't scan your code base and find out if your model is actually conforming to the PowerPoint slide. Yeah? <laughs> that would be nice if that would be possible. But that's why you see so many times, I've seen that, really, especially when I do those assessments, it's really cool, because they come with these elaborated slides about their architecture and describe that. And this is our architecture. You see something like 20, 30 boxes, all very nicely arranged, and makes a lot of sense. And then 
you scan the code base and now can you show me those boxes in the code base and then people stare at you when we're supposed to do that. <coughs> so it's, it's not for, for most of them it's not possible anymore. And the architecture is lost in the code base. So the PowerPoint slides have very little to do with what you actually find in the code base. So that was the initial idea and that was what people were coding against, but if you don't control it, it just erodes it, slips through your fingers. So <clears throat> ideally, so if you have that architecture one, you can actually you, you can actually be aware that if something is broken, you get a report from the tool that tells you, hey, you have an architecture violation here, please fix it. You can make your build fail. Your Jenkins build can fail and send an email to your developer, you broke the build, please fix it. So that way there's no excuses anymore. You can fix it while it's still easy to fix. Then I'm always recommending avoiding cyclic dependencies, at least on the package level, if you can. Sometimes it's not possible, but most of the time it's possible. And it's always, there are always programming techniques out there which allow you to break up cycles. And that's something I'm going to show you here as an example. That's, that's bad coding, bad architecture here. We have a presentation layer and a model layer. And the presentation calls the model, that is fine. But then the stupid model calls back to the presentation layer, which creates a cycle between those two layers. So they're not really layers anymore, and that's undesirable. Because now we cannot test the model without the presentation layer, and that's bad. The model should be independent from the presentation layer. Because just imagine you want to do a service-oriented architecture, and we want to be the model not being dependent on some, some other stuff in our old presentation layer. So that's a bad idea. But it's very easy to fix. Dependency and version principle according to Robert C. Martin. And that means instead of <coughs> calling that thing directly here, we introduce an interface. The alarm clock calls the interface, and the interface is implemented by our presentation layer. So now we completely decouple the two things, at least at compile time. And that's the important thing here. We're talking about static dependencies, compile time dependencies. Of course, at runtime, that call still goes up here. But maybe, but we don't know at this level, because now if you want to test your model layer, you can just create a mock uh, implementation of that I alarm handler interface and do something else with it. So the alarm handler doesn't, the model doesn't have to know anymore who receives, who implements that interface and what they do with it. So that decouples the two, and now you can test, reuse, comprehend the model layer completely independent from the presentation layer. Okay, any questions up to here? How long is the time? So uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay, that should be fine. Okay, then how do you describe your architecture? UML actually has those nice UML component diagrams and they're, they're a way to describe software architecture. So they look like this, you have those components, they can nest other components inside and, and the components can talk to each other over outgoing and incoming connections. Somehow, that's a way to describe software architecture in a graphical way. Now, we, we have, have our tool Sonograph out since, I said, almost 11, 11 years by now, but we made a very big mistake at the beginning because we did graphical modeling of architecture, yeah, which means it's very nice if you can draw a diagram quickly and, and, and see how it works, but it doesn't scale very well for large systems. That's what we found out over time, because if systems get pretty big and you have, then your architecture diagram also gets pretty big, and then it's like with UML, so if you, if you want to show certain classes how they hang together, UML diagram is a very nice way to do it, but if you want to show your whole application in form of a UML diagram, you won't see anything anymore, it's just a big big uh, wallpaper basically, basically with lots of classes and relationships and, and a graph that is not very intuitive anymore. Yeah? The same is true for big architecture diagrams. That's why we did something else now, we, since we have a new generation, and we invented a domain-specific language to describe architecture. And that actually scales very well in something that developers understand naturally. Developers write code. Why not also describe your architecture in form of code? That seems to be a natural approach. And, and now, just to give you a first impression how that works, on the left side you see a simple architecture diagram, and on the right side you see the translation of that diagram into a domain-specific language. 
The domain-specific language only has one concept, that's the artifact. And the artifact basically is a box in our architecture diagram. So here we have a UI box, and the UI box has two nested boxes, controller and view, and then we have a business box. And on the right side you see how we map this to the code. So the artifact UI box is a bigger artifact that contains two nested artifacts, and it contains some include statements. The include statements are where basically the, your code base is mapped to those boxes. So in that case, what are we mapping? We're mapping Java, C++, or C Sharp code in that case. And we need to find some naming convention how we map our code. And those are basically fully qualified uh, file names basically with a module as a root. So basically, if I had a Java system here, I could say every package that has UI in its name would show up in this UI artifact. And then every additional package from those UI packages that have also controller in the name would show up in the UI controller artifact, in the nested artifact. It means if you, if you, if you look at that UI artifact, it has a bunch of Java files in it. And now you make subsets of this bunch of Java files. So the, the controller package and the, view, the controller artifact and the view artifact can select from those UI types and pick some of them. They belong to me and the other one belong to, to you. So they do this by, by using an additional qualifier, like everything that has controller in their name because it belongs to my controller layer, and everything that has view in their name belongs to the view layer. So basically, you, you put a bunch of, uh, of Java files into your architectural model. The artifacts tend, pick the files that are matched by the include statements into their things, and then you can define the rules. And the rules are defined with those connect statements. For example, line 9. If you look at line 9, it says connect to view. It means basically uh, <coughs> connect my controller artifact to the view artifact. Everything in controller can use everything in view. And in this language, everything has to be explicit. So you don't have implicit dependencies. If you don't make a connection, the code in an artifact can't use any other code, except code that is outside of any artifact. The other rule is that if you, if you don't assign anything to an artifact, it's free game, everybody can use it. But as soon as you assign something to an artifact, it must be defined who can use it, actually. So it gives us a couple of advantages. First of all, as soon as you understand the language, and that takes you about, I would say, two hours to understand that language, to, to be able to, to, to write your first architectural model and, and work with it. And it's easy to read and understand. Everybody with a text editor can write an architectural file. Uh, and it's, it's, it goes like code. It's committed together with your code. It's version controlled together with your code. Because architecture is also lives over time and changes over time, like, like your code changes over time. It's easy to make diffs of it. You can find out who changed what, when, and why, maybe. Uh, and it's more powerful than just drawing boxes. You can generate diagrams out of it, and you can actually work with architecture. You can use basically other tools to generate this language if you want to. Some people use rational architect to generate our architecture language or their diagrams. So <clears throat> if you look at the structure of the language, if you look at architecture, if you want to describe the architecture of a software system, what is the atomic assignment unit for architecture? And that's a decision that we had to make on some level. And for us, the atomic unit in Java would be a single Java file. That is the smallest unit you can assign to an architectural artifact. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to cut your architecture in the middle of a Java file. Yeah, that, that's, that's not something we wanted to support. So that's the smallest unit of assignment. In C Sharp, it's the same thing. It's a single C Sharp file. And in C++, it's a little bit more complicated because in C++, you have header and source files, and you need to combine the two. So in that case, it's a unit of a header and source file that belongs together that forms a single component. That's how we call it. And that actually comes from the John Marcus definition from that book from John Marcus, what I was talking about before. So and if you want to address a component, you use its name. And the naming scheme is very simple. Every, every component belongs to a module. That is something like an Eclipse project or an IntelliJ module. Mm -hmm. And then under there, you have the fully qualified name of the Java file without the .java ending relative to its source root directory. 
which is basically in Java it's a package name and the, the class name. Yeah? What comes out of it. And as soon as you have your naming strategy, you can create patterns like we do on the bottom. For example, if I say core slash star star slash business slash star star, I mean everything from the core module that has business in it in somehow in the package name belongs to that particular thing. The core obstructions are artifacts. So an artifact can contain code, components that we assign over include statements, and then it can contain other artifacts. And each artifact has one more obstruction, which was not very clear from the first example. This has incoming and outgoing ports. That's what you saw in the, in the UML diagram before. They have all these incoming and outgoing things. And that's the same what we have in this language. We call those outgoing ports connectors and the incoming <coughs> ports interfaces. So every artifact can have a number of interfaces and a number of connectors. And each artifact at least has a default interface and a default connector that's implicitly there without you having to do anything. And the default interface contains everything that's in that artifact and the default connector the same. So, um, <clears throat> basically if you do a connection, you always connect a connector to an interface. When we say connect to view, like in the example before, we actually mean something like here. You could also write it like this, like in this line line, you can see connect default to viewpoint default is exactly what the, what the language would implicitly assume if you just say connect to view. Use my default connector and connect it to the default interface of that other thing. Now I'm going to um, show you that thing live, so to make it a little bit more clear what you can do with it and how it works. Any questions up to now? I think we have to make that a little bigger, right, so that people can actually see what's going on. Um, I'm trying to use this magic Mac feature here. <laughs> Is that working? Yes. Can everybody read it? Okay. What I'm showing you here is actually the architecture of our own tool, the architecture of Sonograph. Of course, we're eating our own dog food to describe our architecture in our own way. And Sonograph has a pretty simple architecture. It's basically there's a big core that does all the language agnostic stuff. Yeah? And then it has three different language providers, one for Java, one for C-sharp, and one for C and C++. And then we have user interfaces for the three language providers, and the user interface components for the language providers. And we have something like a shared user, face, user interface component that basically contains all the language agnostic stuff that is not dependent on the specific language. So those are artifacts here. UI Java is basically the Java part of our user interface. And I can actually uh, visualize how that looks in the code base. I'm going to find this here. Just make a little graph out of it. So this is how it looks like in the dependency graph. Yeah? So basically you have those different elements. And for example, by UI Java has dependencies down to the language provider Java, it has dependencies to common, UI common, so the shared user interface part, the core part, and something like, like it's basic stuff on the, on the bottom. So I can click on those things and see how they're together. And green means everything is just fine. Yellow means there might be an architecture violation here. And we're going to talk about that later. But now I can actually put those things next to each other. Therefore, I need to just reduce the zoom level for a second that I can actually do it here. Find my code and show it parallel to the thing. So that's my sonographer marker here, and I'm making it bigger again. Now, the, the, those checks are live. For example, if I would just disconnect my UI Java from the rest of my system, becoming some red edges here. Basically, now all those dependencies that I just cut off here are marked as red arcs. Yeah. So you have a live architecture check. And that is something, of course, you can also run in your Jenkins and then you get a nice list of architecture violations and can make the build fail if an architecture violation is someplace. 
So let's fix that again. Okay, now let's look at this code a little bit. So for the UI, Java, C Sharp, they all have some common obvious dependencies it's connected to core, to the core UI part, and to its language provider. And it's actually connected more precisely to the UI interface of core because we're using an interface here. The language provider Java also has a UI interface. In UI common, we just use a default interface. Now if I look at UI common, that has some cool feature inside here. We nest, because this, this application is based on Eclipse RCP, the rich client platform. We, we want to make sure that nobody from our core classes, from the bottom of our application, has access to the Eclipse class, because we want to make an IntelliJ plugin and all kind of stuff. We can't have Eclipse dependencies all over the code base. So that's why we just put this in the UI common part here as a nested artifact. Now, everybody who's using UI common can also use that Eclipse stuff but nobody else. So no, everybody who is not, does not have allowed dependencies to UI common cannot use Eclipse classes. And that's a typical use case. Think about data access layers. For example, you want to make sure that the JPA classes and, and Hibernate classes are only used from your data access layer. Just create a nested artifact in your data access layer containing Hibernate and JPA. And then you can even create it, make it a hidden artifact. That means nobody from the outside can see it. So then you can make sure that only your data layer will, will only access those Hibernate classes and no one else. One simple thing. Now let's look at the language providers. They all have a very similar structure inside. Same layering. So you have a command layer, controller layer, persistence layer, and so on. And instead of having to basically define that every time, I just outsource the definition of my layering into an extra file. So this file, called layering.arc, describes now the layering. It describes my command layer that can use model and controller. Controller can use persistent model and so on. And I also define that, that ominous UI interface, which I've been referring to right here, because I want to make sure that the UI only uses the command layer, the model layer, and the foundation layer. Foundation layer. I want to make sure that nobody directly accesses the controller from the outside. Yeah? That is done by using that interface, which only exposes a subset of all those layers to the UI component of my application. Now, if you go back to the other one, we see how this is used. It just says here, um, apply layering, and then we import this file into the structure, inhabit that structure, and we use it in that place to describe how this is looking. So let's just scratch this on the surface. There's a lot of possibilities what you can do with this language. And also with this tool, um, there's a free version of it. It's called Sonograph Explorer. Yeah, you, that, that basically makes all those nice dependency visualization graphs. Just show you a couple of them. If I can unzoom that thing again. Let's make a full screen mode. You already saw that exploration view. <coughs> Why doesn't it? Actually, it doesn't work for some reason, but okay doesn't matter. I can take anything here, in, and that works with Sonograph Explorer 2, which is basically the little sister product of this one, and visualize dependencies. So if you want to see how your code is organized, how it is structured, just select something in the navigation view, and it will create a dynamic dependency view for that. I can also show that in this exploration view we saw before. This is this one here where the arcs are going counterclockwise and you can really drill down into more details and find out what's going on down here. You know, it's all the different levels of dependencies. So it's very useful if you want to understand the code base. If you want to enforce rules on the code base, you will more likely need the architect product, which is the commercial version of it. Okay, so that <coughs> should give you a quick idea how you can actually define an architectural model in a formal way and automatically enforce it. And I think that's a very important part which, which you all should at least try once and look into it to find out how your project can benefit from it. I can tell you that, that we have many customers that use it for many, many years and they saved them a lot of heartaches to do that from the beginning, to do that in a consistent way. Any questions? Yeah. 
you say like, like it enforces a constraint where you say like, I don't want, for example, business logic being implemented in the presentation layer. Is that yeah. something that that's something that you can actually define by a rule. Yeah. Okay. Because how do you find out that you will have some dependencies from your business layer which shouldn't appear on your UI layer that, that, that way you can basically find those kind of violations. Mm -hmm. Or many people don't want basically SQL code in your, your, their UI layer and stuff like that. Yeah. So, or people calling back the UI layer from the controller layer, another nice use case also happens sometimes. Uh, all those things can be told completely stopped by, by using a formal architecture. And you can find them as soon as they're created, which is a cool thing. Just let it run with your Jenkins every time and then there's no excuse anymore. People will find the problem immediately. I got two questions. Yeah. I guess the first question is, um, do you find that you can use this tool where there's already an already existing code base. Yeah, that is the 80% use case, and and I can say yes and no because there are cases where it basically doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah. When the code base is uh, beyond a certain point, when it's totally messed up, and you don't plan to actually factor it or to do anything about it that it's messed up, then you might just as well not use it because it won't make a difference. If you have a code base that is salvageable, or you have a code base that has to live for a long time and is messed up, then you can use this tool to gradually improve it. Because what you do if you have a messed up architecture, then you just try something very simple in the beginning. You just create two or three major blocks of your application, and try to define those, and try to make sure that they are in the right kind of dependency structure and, and work on there. And I guess, is there uh, a site that you found to be Size. Well, the bigger, the more important it is, I would say. The bigger your project is, the more you need this. Well, but I can imagine that if you put this on a big project, like it's all red, right? Yeah, that depends on what kind of rules you define. So if you, if you put it on a big project that is already messed up, define as few rules as possible. To try something simple in the beginning so that not, you, you're not starting with 10,000 violations because that will take the motivation out pretty quickly. Yeah. Do something simple in the beginning, try simple and then, then enhance from there, step by step. It's, it's a gradual process, but it's painful. But, but, but sometimes you don't have a choice, because if you want to keep that software alive and you don't do anything, everything is getting worse. I think I'm running out of time here, and I have another very cool speaker. There are two hands up there.